Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Today we have with us Dr. Sarah Walker, who is a research assistant professor in the Division of Public Behavioral Health and Justice Policy. She received her doctorate in counseling psychology at the University of Southern California and completed her clinical internship at the West LA Healthcare Administration and a postdoc fellowship in our department at the U. Her work focuses on the intersection of mental health, juvenile offending, and systems reform. She is the principal investigator on a National Institute of Justice grant evaluating the effectiveness of Washington's facilities for incarcerated youth, and is the principal investigator on additional projects related to youth violence prevention, gender-specific treatment, and community outreach. In 2013, Dr. Walker worked, worked closely with colleagues and state legislators to develop and support the passage of House Bill 1524, which expands division, diversion options for youth with mental health disorders exposed to the justice system. Dr. Walker is also significantly involved in translational science activities with the Department of Social and Health Services under Dr. Eric Truthman. Uh, with these activities, Dr. Walker is conducting a GAPS analysis of children's mental health services in the state, as well as evaluating the outcomes of evidence-based practices within children's administration. Dr. Walker also developed and is teaching an interdisciplinary applied research course through psychiatry that pairs graduate students with community agencies in need of evaluation assistance. In 2013, Dr. Walker was the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Champions for Change Award in recognition for her efforts within juvenile justice system reform. Dr. Walker. Thank you. So I, when I've done versions of this talk before, I like to start with what I think is an amusing story from my own life. Uh, when I was 16 years old, um, a neighborhood, a, a neighbor boy, neighborhood friend, asked me out on a date. And at that time, I was um, sort of exploring my, my feminist leanings, and I had decided that I did not want um, doors open for me. It was like a stand that I was taking. And this really robbed this guy the wrong way. And it's like totally overshadowed this whole evening that we had. He's really bugged by it. So it's like, whatever. We didn't, you know, go out again. So then, like, fast forward five years later, and we actually are both at USC. I'm doing my doctoral work. He was in law school, and we reconnected. And, and we hung out a couple of times, and he brought this up again. Like, remember that time? You don't want your door open for you. It was really annoying. What's wrong with you? And I was. Kind of like, what well, you could just get over that. It's not that big of a deal. So, anyway, you know, nothing really happened there. We lost touch. Okay, so fast forward like 10 years later, I'm scrolling through Facebook and I see this thread and it says, What is the worst date that you ever had? And this guy posted a date when the girl wouldn't let me open the door for her. <laughs> so, Actually, it really made me giggle. So I was like, holy cow, like who, how many people can be somebody's worst date ever? That's like, <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to mention that because when we talk about gender, um, it can be a very emotionally kind of fraught topic, and maybe only fools tread into that area. Um, there's, uh, I want to kind of get out in front of the fact that this topic is much broader than I can do any justice to today. Um, there's all sorts of dimensions around um, you know, the social context and development of gender identity. There's a lot of really interesting work being done on um, how many genders there may be. Um, a lot of great work being done on you know, like neurobiological differences and how those express socially. So I'm, when you think about gender as kind of a biopsychosocial construct today, I'm, I'm really going to, because of time constraints and other things, we're really going to narrow on like the psycho, the psychological part of that, and when I can sort of make a nod to some of the other complexities around gender. I also want to mention that I'm going to be, when I talk about girls, um, I'm, I'm really talking about um, kind of female body, female, female identified um, individuals, and today I'm not going to be doing um, justice or talking a lot about um, transgender or um, girls that 
uh, maybe identify in the Floodsian or in the continuum, um, uh, just because we don't have time. But it'd be a great topic, and someone else should do it, or I could do it later. Um, so today we're talking about girls, as imperfectly as that is defined. Um, so I'm going to do just, I'm not sure how savvy folks are about the justice system in general, so I'm just going to start kind of a very brief, hopefully interesting, informative background just on the justice system itself. And I want to give a shout out to my research analyst, Asia, who correctly identified this person um, up on the screen. So this is, someone else may know it. Anybody else know who this is? What's that? Oh. Yeah. Asia, you're the smartest one in the room. Congratulations. <laughs> this is Jean Adams. So yeah, I know you know her by name. I actually wouldn't have known what she looked like either, but I Googled it. By the way, has anybody else Googled today? Any other Googlers? International Women's Day. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> it's International Women's Day. Something else I did not know until I Googled. So how fun is it that we get to talk about girls on International Women's Day? OK. So quick history of the juvenile justice system. Prior to the late 1800s, um, kids that got in trouble with the law were sentenced and uh, just like adults and sent to adult facilities. So this applied to boys as well, but because I wanted to be in theme today, I just put up some pictures of girls um, who were sent uh, sometimes for hard labor in adult facilities for things like theft, uh, stealing a coat. This 15-year-old Margaret, Margaret Cox, who's on the left of the screen, um, spent two months in an adult facility. <coughs> so Jane Addams comes in the picture because the late 19th century was you know, something we, we learned is, uh, is the progressive era, right? So a bunch of progressives that wanted to um, improve particularly public systems and focus on poverty. Um, and the first juvenile court, appropriately, because that's where Jane Addams was, was set up in Chicago um, in 1899. And juvenile courts were established because there was a recognition that kids were fundamentally different in adults in their ability to understand the consequences of their behavior and in their ability to be rehabilitated. And that um, the view was that largely these kids were coming into contact because there was insufficient kind of parental oversight authority um, or confidence, and so the courts became really um, these kind of more civil courts where there was just a judge, so there was no defense of prosecution, no jury, and the judges had a lot of control. They had all the control over kind of what kids might be ordered to do as a result of coming in contact with the system. So it started with a very um, strong social work focus with the judge really acting as that primary social worker. So it seemed like a really good idea because kids were taken out of the adult court. But one of the consequences was that um, some, some judges sort of abused the power of having so much power. And there were a number of cases where kids were sent to kind of reform schools or whatever for, for long periods of time for fairly um, what we consider like minor um, indiscretions. And so one of these cases went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 67, um, the Supreme Court rule is that the juvenile court needs to also have due protections, just like the adult court. And so it became, again, kind of an adversarial system with now prosecutors and defense um, and the judge. Some of the differences, though, is that it still, um, in theory, relies more on a rehabilitative model, more so than the adult court might. And so there's still a lot of attention focused on how to help um, how to provide treatment to sort of um, mitigate future contacts with the juvenile justice system or stop a longer term and or stop a longer term course of criminal involvement. All right, so what about girls? Um, well, some interesting thing, we're going to talk about some different trends in girls' <coughs> sentencing um, behavior, but what sort of act, what really stands out is that um, girls' pathways into the juvenile just, justice system has stayed uh, fairly consistent over time and the kinds of things that are uh, they're doing that's getting them involved. So in 1932, the Children's Bureau released a report around the kinds of things that you know they were seeing for girls who were involved in the justice system. And it was a lot of running away, parents feeling like they couldn't control them, um, and so they were coming to the courts for support. And in, and in now, uh, <laughs> modern days, um, over half of the girls um, who are coming into the uh, juvenile justice system are reporting um, a lot of family conflicts that are instigating uh, much of that contact, and we'll, we'll talk more about that too. 
Girls are also more likely to run away, and when they run away, they're more likely to be uh, picked up and arrested. And there's a kind of a sense we have a law in our state called the Becca Bill <clears throat> that um, kind of uh, is consistent with this view that the juvenile court should be used as a tool in sort of the protection of youth, and particularly girls, which is a, um, a particular view um, that not all people share. So this is just an example from one girl who kind of who is who is justice justice involved as a result, uh, particularly a family conflict. Um, and I liked this quote because this seems so reasonable. So she's saying like, you know, my parents have completely unreasonable expectations. How am I supposed to be back at two a.m. when I leave at twelve? That's just ridiculous. So, and so what will happen is that parents try to keep them from leaving, and that might escalate into conflict, and they call the police, and then um, the girl could be charged. Um, with an assault because of that interaction. We'll talk more about that too. Um, and just another uh, kind of quote that <clears throat> the recognition that parents, um, you know, are turning to the police to reinforce their authority is the primary reason for a lot of girls' involvement. Okay, so some of the recent or somewhat recent changes in the involvement of girls in the justice system. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of the girl, a lot of the behavior that's driving girl involvement has to do with like running away or what we call status offenses, which are things that would not be illegal except for the kid's age. And the reason that they, that they can come to the contact of the, the uh, attention of the justice system is that the idea that we intervene early enough in those, we can protect the kid from harming themselves, or we can mitigate future criminal offending. But the problem was that then you were putting kids who hadn't technically done anything really wrong. Um, in uh, detention facilities, um, which by itself maybe is problematic, but also they were getting exposed to kids who had done things that we would consider really a lot more serious. So there's a federal act, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, which establishes these kind of guidelines that courts have to follow if the state is going to be eligible for federal funding. So it's, it's, they can't sort of mandate, or they don't, it doesn't mandate um, things, uh, like policies, but it can tie funding, to, and so there's a lot of compliance with these guidelines. And so in 1980, um, the reinstitution of this act was revised to say that you could not lock up status offenders, um, which would include runaways, um, even if, they, if, even if um, they had violated a court order. So a lot of what would happen is that a, a kid would run away, they get picked up, they come in before the judge, and the judge would say, Okay, don't run away anymore, and also go to school, and also listen to your parents. And then the kid wouldn't go to school, and the judge would say, okay, you violated the court order, and now you're going to go to detention. And it's called bootstrapping, and it was a really common way, um, particularly for girls, um, to get uh, detention time. So, so you can't do that anymore. Um, and it was really effective in reducing the numbers um, of status offenders who were detained. However, <laughs> Concurrent with the implementation of that policy to not detain status offenders, the rate of girls who were involved in the justice system doubled from the 1980s to 1994. So what was going on? So like just coincidentally, they're not locking up status offenders anymore, but girls are being represented in the justice system for um, non-status offenders, not status offenders at much higher rates. So it seems like it's probably too much to be a coincidence, right? Um, and I'll just note, too, that right now, girls are represented in the justice system at higher rates than they've ever been before in previous history. Um, they now hover around 30%, where in the past, they were kind of closer to um, the high teens or 20%, um, which is one of the reasons that people are really interested in looking at this right now. So what, what was going on? Um, so when you look closer at the data, a lot of that increased. You can see right here. Let me just click this little thingy. Um, so, this, so this right here, this blue line, are simple assault charges. Simple assaults are like these um, assaults that don't result in like any bodily injury or harm, but there's been a threat of some harm. Um, and then these are aggravated assaults where there would be some injury. So these are girls' aggravated assaults at very low rates. Simple assaults are right around the time that um, we instituted the reduction of staff offenders in detention. There's a steady climb, steady climb, steady climb, steady climb that's been going up. Um, you know, similar for boys, much higher rates, but 
uh, boys have dipped down a little more quickly, particularly for simple assaults. You boys even come down below in terms of rape, which is uh, really significant. So what we think is happening is that girls who would have been previously charged as status offenders were now being charged as, as for assaults. And it's fairly easy to do because a lot of, there's a lot of discretion around it, what a kid is going to be charged with. Um, and so rather than charging them with a less serious offense, they charge them with something that can actually get them to some detention time. So it seems, it, for some, it might seem like a good idea in terms of actually getting a connect kid sort of a a connected with services or getting some treatment. On the other hand, uh, we get really concerned about collateral consequences of that um, on a number of levels. Is there a question in the back? Okay. I'm just wondering, is there a sense that these kids who would have otherwise been in for status offenses are now free to go and actually commit simple assaults and are therefore being, you know, they're actually increased in their criminal behavior? I mean, I know it's not severe criminal behavior. But. So the question is, um, maybe an alternative view would be that because the kids weren't getting picked up for status offenses and being detained, that they were then free to actually be committing uh, more serious assaults because they, is that correct? Yeah. Um, I think that, I don't know that anybody's, I guess the short answer is I don't know that anybody specifically looked at that. If I was to think about what I know um, about detention, the research is actually pretty strong and pretty clear about the fact that um, it doesn't provide a long-term deterrent effect. So I guess you could argue that for the time that they might have spent in detention that they wouldn't be um, doing crimes otherwise, but um, it's a good question, and I don't know that name specifically looked at it. Uh, what people have uh, thought is happening is that, um, as I was saying, there's a, num there's a lot of discretion on what a kid could be charged with. And so a kid, um, instead of being charged with a status offense, the police office officer could say, well, okay, you're running away, but you also, right before you ran away, had this altercation with your family. We're going to charge you under that um, assault instead of the status offense. And so, that again, it's, you know, that sort of anecdotally and what the research seems to suggest is what happened. All right. So that's kind of the background on sort of this phenomenon. The, the fact that girls are kind of um, represented now in higher numbers than they've been previously is sort of sparking all this conversation about okay, the justice system was kind of the traditional model was kind of um, developed and and arguably imperfectly for boys. But let's go ahead and look at whether what we know about um, male kind of conduct problems and delinquency fits for girls. Um, or do we have kind of a significant mismatch and do we need to alter our models and our, and our policies and our ways of intervening with girls? And so these are kind of the three, um, these are the three topics that I'll address in the rest of the talk. So the first one is, what do girls coming into the justice system look like and how do they compare to boys? Because first of all, we want to know um, just in terms of treatment, uh, particularly if girls are in longer term facilities, kind of are the existing kind of treatment supports that are set up adequate for girls. Um, but also we're interested in that because that gives us maybe some clues into things that could be <coughs> driving um, conduct or delinquent behavior that um, we're not picking up on for boys. So the first thing, this is actually really new data, which is great, um, a relatively recent data, national data. Some of you may have seen this um, citation in, in, in other places. But what they did is they looked at um, delinquent kids versus non-delinquent kids, the caveat being that they looked at non-detained delinquent kids. So arguably, this is a less severe population than what you would find if you were looking in correctional facilities. Um, look at some of these rates, though. They're pretty astounding. So the rate for girls who are adjudicated delinquent, um, for PTSD, it's 23% as compared to the population sample of like 7% for girls, even lower, obviously, for boys. 45% um, for major depression. Um, alcohol abuse is pretty similar for girls and boys who are both delinquent, obviously, and then, and then higher than for a uh, community population. Um, drug use, also similar, but higher than a community population. Sexual assault, <clears throat> a lot higher for delinquent girls um, uh, than the community population for girls or boys. Uh, physical assault, though, interestingly, more um, self-reported um, by boys, and we'll talk a little bit about the nuances of that, too, and then physical abuse being fairly comparable. So what do we see? Obviously, a lot higher PTSD, uh, major depression, and kind of serious psychological um, issues um, with 
tying that to increased sexual assault, but not necessarily higher rates of physical assault. When you look at a, a correctional population of girls, you see even higher rates. So then you see something more in the range of almost half um, experiencing current PTSD symptoms, 65% having some symptoms of PTSD, and 70% exposed to some type of trauma. And this comes from one particular study. There's been estimates um, of that being upwards, um, higher of like 80, 85% or higher. And then um, additional studies that kind of <clears throat> uh, look at the experiences of girls socially, and this is kind of one of the areas where we think about that other lens around sort of uh, the social construction of gender, how girls um, feel, um, get a sense of worth in their lives, that uh, justice involved girls um, in general can report having problems with feelings of worthlessness, particularly tie their status to that of like higher status males, which can be problematic for a lot of reasons. Um, they report being uh, more sensitive to perceived threats and others' expectations around their behaviors. Um, and also some interesting findings that girls who display some of the traits that would, could be risk factors for justice involvement uh, for boys too, in terms of like higher impulsivity and lower empathy, that because those are gender non-normative for girls, those kind of traits, that they're even further socially isolated. So even some of the risks that are common between boys and girls for um, justice involvement or kind of conduct behavior potentially present in some, for some girls an even higher risk because of the social consequences of that behavior. Um, and I think that this is a poignant quote that kind of sums that up, which is that the violent girl um, is once more socially conscious, kind of aware of folks' expectations, um, and, and more brutalized um, in terms of um, sexual violence as well as the, the impact of some of the um, non-acceptance of their behaviors in their own social groups than the violent boy and then the least connected to their families. So multiple layers of risk for these girls. And I just wanted to point out that, um, that these trends really hold in Washington state. So this is data, this is just descriptive data that I, but I guess a little more than descriptive, data um, that I ran with um, uh, databases that I have for Washington state. And we see the same thing, uh, girls uh, are more likely to have run away from home, they have higher rates of home conflict, they're less close to their fathers, higher rates of sex abuse. And then interestingly, they have um, lower risk when it comes to school conduct. And I think that's really school conduct problems. Um, and I think that's really interesting because if we think about a particular pathway for girl involvement being conflict in the home and that being a real trigger, um, it's sort of provocative to think that, that maybe they're not displaying um, problematic behavior across multiple um, institutions, but this is something, at least for some of the girls, and we'll talk about heterogeneity because I um, really want to challenge the idea that all girls are the same or come into the system the same way, but that um, for some girls these problems um, might be particularly localized to their um, homes. All right, so when we look at characteristics of girls, we see that they have significantly greater mental health um, challenges in some areas, um, particularly around internalizing. Um, and more sexual trauma. So the question becomes, are these factors relevant in explaining justice involvement? Um, do, we, do we think they're relevant? Um, and do the criminal pathway models that have been currently developed, um, particularly around boys, do they explain female delinquency as adequately? And that's important because that has implications for kind of policy and treatment recommendations that we might come up with. So turning to some of the predictors of delinquency and pathway models, this was a really nice systematic review um, that was conducted um, uh, across a broad array of literature in terms of what predicts girls' offending um, uh, behavior and conduct problems. And so the, obviously the overlapping um, area of that diagram are all the shared risks. And there would be the things that you would think of. So um, their ADHD, low cortisol levels, low resting heart rate, um, early maturation, neuropsych impairments, you can read them. And then for males, there seem to be some um, specific risks tied to uh, you know, genetic vulnerability, genotype, um, sens higher sensitivity to fight or flight, uh, fight or flight um, can predict justice involvement. Um, and then for girls, um, adversarial and personal relationships um, really emerges as something that is a higher risk for girls. So even when uh, boys are in families that are characterized by high, high conflict, 
um, they're less likely to um, have that be predictive of their justice involvement as it is for girls. And then there are also some other kind of neuropsych um, implications for girls, which I'm sure folks in the room would be more sophisticated about than I am. I'm really focused on the psychosocial point of potential intervention. All right, and then other studies that have kind of done direct comparisons, because that was a systematic review, so they weren't necessarily doing direct comparisons. Um, in doing group direct comparisons, this was a study that was done actually out of um, our social development um, research group here at UW, out of School of Social Work. We do a lot of work in this area. Um, David Hawkins and Abigail Fagan as the first author. And they looked at a number of risk and protective factors around predictors of delinquency. And what they found was similar, like there's a lot of shared risk factors for delinquency. I mean, you know, you have um, you know, poverty, neighborhood disorganization, and all those things are going to be not great for both boys and girls. What was interesting is when they found specific gender interactions in terms of what was more or less predictive, they didn't find any variables that predicted girl um, delinquency better. All of the gender interactions were, were in favor of um, uh, predictive valence for males, um, which suggests that while we're, we, we know we know a fair amount about what are predictors for girls. We're missing something because we're we're not really finding you know at least when they study the direct comparison things that tend to be uh, stronger predictors for girls. And then the third kind of area of research around this, when we look at pathway models of delinquency, um, and so this is so a pathway model of delinquency is figuring out what are kind of the classes of youth that do certain types of crimes. And then what is their long-term trajectory for criminal behavior? Um, and there's some really robust kind of pathway models um, that look at whether it's overt criminological pathways, so there's a lot of fighting, there's a lot of destruction, there's covert, which is kind of sneakier, more theft, um, and authority conflict, which is maybe they're not so violent um, and disruptive, but they're sneaking out, they're breaking rules. Um, and these models do okay for girls, but not as good for boys, and they're really actually pretty poor at predicting serious delinquency for girls. Okay, so um, more could be done. So this is a study that uh, I've been leading in uh, in collaboration with folks in the School of Social Work as well as the University of Buffalo, and I was really interested in looking at, let's go ahead and take uh, the risk and need kind of characteristics of girls Take out the equation of criminal criminal history, and let's just look at kind of if we were to look at risks and needs, how would these girls kind of lump into these into broad classes? Because what I was really, what I'm concerned about with the existing research that's out there is that when they do kind of class analysis on girls, and latent class analysis briefly is a way to um, in a sample with kind of a lot of a heterogeneity around different variables. Um, how can you kind of cluster, how can you find clusters of groups that sort of describe certain kinds um, of characteristics for people? It's a way of, so grouping people. And when this is done previously with justice involved girls, they almost always throw in something around criminal history. And because criminal history is, is such a um, strong, you know, it, it's uh, so clearly different between groups, it sort of pulls everything else around it. And so what you typically end up with is like low, moderate, high-risk groups, which if you're interested in like within your high-risk group, are there different treatment needs? You wouldn't find it, you know, if you throw in criminal history. So I wanted to take criminal history out and just throw in um, all the risks and needs. And some brief descriptions of this study, this comes from um, statewide data we have um, about 1,700 girls in this analysis, um, predominantly Caucasian, which kind of represents the demographic distribution in our state, um, with the next uh, largest group being Latino and then African American, um, kids around 15 years old. So I won't bore you with um, kind of all of the scale construction, everything we did, but suffice it to say, that every time a kid um, comes in contact with the juvenile justice system in our state at, the, at a certain level, they get what's a court risk assessment. And the risk assessment has um, about 10 domains of social and kind of criminal history. And it's been validated for um, recidivism prediction. 
So we were able to gather this data, but we were able to get these risk assessments for all of these girls who touched the system at any time in 2008, and then we got their full criminal history back, too. So what we did is we took the first risk assessment that these girls had on file at any point um, because we were interested in kind of how they present when they first come into the justice system. And um, basically, like I said, I won't tell you about our scale construction and everything, but just trust me, it was, it was all fine. Um, <laughs> but these are the domains that uh, we, we ended up looking at. So some of these are very intentional around wanting to look specifically at what we consider this female pathway of um, justice involvement. So we looked at running away, um, not having positive adult relationships, <coughs> school performance, um, family conflict, negative peer ties, parenting discipline, parenting problems. So parenting problems, if, if a parent had uh, their own mental health or substance use or mental health, or, uh, problem, mental health substance use problem. Um, which is different from parenting discipline, which is where they not adequately supervising and monitoring their kids. Uh, if they had a history of neglect or sexual abuse or physical abuse, if there was a history of any mental health treatment, um, the number of out-of-home placements experienced by the kid. And we also looked at drug and alcohol use because the bench kind of the baseline is so high, we wanted to um, we wanted to look particularly at whether the drug or alcohol use was actually causing disruption. Um, in the kid's life. So we threw all those into our latent class analysis model, and we found something what I, which I consider pretty interesting. We, came, we found four classes. Um, and so right off the bat, I was really happy that we just didn't find three <laughs> low, moderate, and high-risk classes. We actually have a little more nuance than that. Um, this first class here at the top is characterized by really high level, the highest levels um, of trauma. Uh, which, you know, I kind of shorthand here for the highest levels of neglect, sexual abuse, and physical abuse um, in the sample, as well as um, high family conflict, lots of out-of-home placement, and lots of disruption, or a moderate, moderate amount of disruption due to substance use. So a really high trauma um, kind of disrupted class. Then another, the next class that um, emerged was a class that looked really um, good, I mean, relatively good on a lot of high protective factors, um, lower risk factors, with a little bit of mental health. So a little bit higher mental health than some of the other classes. And then the next one had the lowest rates of trauma in mental health mean, very low rates of uh, least reported um, neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and previous mental health use. But they um, had moderate, uh, moderately high levels of poor parenting discipline. And then the last class uh, was the one that looked, you know, when you think of high risk, they sort of had risk across all domains, um, particularly very strong and negative peer ties. Um, they also had kind of rates of trauma and um, things like that. And then we also ran some additional covariates to kind of further describe these classes and to reveal some interesting things. And this is why, and it kind of reinforced why I was glad that we didn't put uh, criminal history in to start with, because we found something interesting. This first class with a high trauma family disruption had the highest rates uh, of all the classes in, in violent behavior. They were higher in violent behavior for outbursts, they were higher for violence to inflict pain, they were higher for violence with a weapon, they were highest for fire setting. Um, they were higher across all the violence um, domains, which I don't know that I would have predicted that necessarily for this group. I think I would have thought it would have been highest down here for our highest risk group. So that was really interesting. Um, the next one, uh, you know, I think consistent with it being the lowest kind of risk class, uh, relatively speaking, these kids also had kind of the highest um, family income. Um, but there, and there's also some foster care here. These kids were not the lowest in out-of-home placement and foster care, but they were lowest in sort of other risk domains. And then this third class, they are the ones that are lowest in foster care, and they were the um, most likely to be living with two parents. Um, and why I find that really interesting is that these are kids that are experiencing um, relatively low risk in terms of kind of like internalizing behavior, but because parental monitoring isn't sufficient, they're just getting into trouble 
uh, with peers or, or for other reasons. So their behavior is probably less likely motivated by a kind of internal distress as it is by um, they're just their environments are not being adequately monitored, uh, monitored for them, which is uh, super interesting because that is when you know a kind of a, a really foundational kind of criminological um, theory around youth behavior, which is that it's all about parental monitoring, right? So these kids are really kind of fit in that um, that group. And then our last group here. Um, this group took up all of the variance due to gang involvement. So this is the only place that gang involvement landed. Um, and then they were the ones that had the next highest level of violence. So I think what, why I find this so interesting is because I think that one, it um, more or less validates um, the view in the field that when it comes to girls, we should be really concerned about trauma. And that's really true because trauma, um, at least for these, um, two classes um, is significantly high and is also related to some of the highest disruption in behavior. But I think what this points out is an interesting nuance, which is like, but let's um, let's like not go too overboard here because we do have girls in the system who really aren't experiencing um, those kinds of uh, risks for involvement that could arguably be as easily treated with our more traditional theories about boosting up parenting, you know, parent monitoring and maybe doing some um, relationship work. But otherwise, um, you know, we don't have to, we don't need to get too worried about trauma interventions for those groups. And these groups, I, this group right here would just be our kind of traditional low risk, maybe wrong time, wrong, wrong place kids, and let's try to get them diverted out of the system as much as possible. Okay, so I think to collectively, what, what we're learning from all of this research is that um, interpersonal relationships and trauma really do matter, um, particularly for some uh, classes of youth. So then that leads to our final questions um, around how to work with girls in the justice system, which are, well, so then what treatment strategies may be needed to address this issue? Um, do the existing treatments are they working well enough? Um, is it sort of irrelevant that we now know, you know, all of this about differential risk predictors? Um, do they just do, they do fine? Um, and if not, then what more needs to be done, and what would be some promising strategies for addressing this and trying to be um, have a more differentiated approach with our treatment? So I wanna. Um, Bring back a little bit um, again to this perspective of a more social justice kind of social oppression perspective because it's highly relevant when we talk about what the state of the state is for girls involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, the by far the the most popular interventions um, for girls in the justice system justice system right now are based off of more. Um, uh, feminist-driven theories around, uh, you know, self-image, particularly body image, um, female empowerment. They may include uh, these kind of uh, protocols or programming um, may include sections on like media literacy around uh, female images, and, and some include explicit kind of social justice initiatives that the girls get involved in um, to increase sense of. Um, uh, uh, or a decrease sense of worthlessness and increased sense of empowerment. So that's that's primarily what's happening um, when you talk about gender-specific work in the juvenile justice system. Um, the other viewpoint is sort of the what works literature. And frankly, these two literatures have been pretty contentious, um, and the, the debates have been fairly loud and vocal around what's the best way to work with girls. Um, who get caught up in the justice system. So the what works paradigm comes from what we know about evidence-based practice, um, that you would use kind of a, a more systemic or manualized approach and you would pull from um, uh, uh, programming that's already been shown to be effective with um, boys, or that you wouldn't differentiate, that the, that the chronological factors should be the same. So let's look at the evidence-based practices and how they do with girls. Um, the first thing to say is that uh, the area of research hasn't been wildly concerned with how they're doing with girls, except for recently. So my first caveat with this is like, um, it's too 
early to tell. <laughs> but but from what's out there, MST looks pretty promising for girls, with the caveat being that the only studies that I could find um, uh, were done in Norway, where they looked at um, differential treatment effects for girls with the same authors. And in the first study that they looked at, um, it looked like uh, girls were not benefiting to the same level, that there may have been less successful in preventing out-of-home placement. Um, but then when they sort of did a reanalysis, um, uh, looking at some other populations uh, that included girls, they, they had more promising results around reductions in things like um, uh, externalizing disorders and, and things like that. Although I have some concerns, the second study had some kind of methodological concerns around how they mix populations and stuff. So it's so a little kind of early to say. But suffice it to say that actually MST is being used all the time with girls. So anecdotally, there would probably be a lot of reports that it's working uh, perfectly well. MST you know, is a kind of ecologically driven model that includes some parenting uh, support and skills around with connecting kids to kind of more pro-social supports in their environment. The other sort of big one in dealing with the um, intervention is functional family therapy, which is a systems approach to reducing the conflict in the home, and you would think would be perfect for some of the behaviors that girls are displaying coming in, um, in contact with the justice system. Um, and it does show that girls benefit uh, from FFT more than they would from treatment as usual. Um, interestingly, though, the effect sizes are not as strong for girls as they are for boys. So it kind of reflects some of this other literature that we have that, you know, it's working okay, but it's not, um, it's not as robust as it is for boys. And then um, MTFC is sort of a residential model where a kid actually goes and stays with um, therapeutic foster parents while um, there's work going on with the parents around parenting skills and the, and, and the kids around their own kind of emotion regulation and problem solving skills. So the, one of the first trials of NTSC actually found that girls' behaviors worsened in treatment um, as compared to boys, which uh, very, very much concerned the developers of NTSC and they subsequently did program adaptations and they found that now it works better. So what did they do for program adaptations? They went in and they did more work on um, sensitivity to trauma, and they focused on internalizing disorders and distress, and they focused more on um, relationships and relational and mitigating relational conflict. So that sort of interesting um, sort of supports with these other um, other research that we have. All right. So what about these programs that are developed specifically for girls? Um, that sort of use more of this kind of empowerment model or, or uh, a self-esteem model for intervention. Unfortunately, well, we don't know much about them because they're typically not well studied. Um, so OJJDP, which is the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, um, looked at 62 girl-specific programs that had been um, implemented nationally over like two or two decades. And they got all the information that they could about these programs. They found that fully 72% that they couldn't even like review as far as effectiveness. And then, um, then they found that 16% um, had insufficient evidence of effect when they looked at it. 6% the effects were mixed. And then um, another 6% were promising. But they didn't find any program that they could rate as effective. Um, so. A large part of that is just the rigor of methodological design, um, but it's also just the inability to really show a strong, robust effect with reducing conduct problems and delinquency for girls. Um, I did a study in Washington State. Uh, a lot of the, about eight courts were implementing um, different forms of like a girls group. So, so girls who are on probation, um, instead of getting referred to um, some other type of program like functional family therapy or whatever, or, refer, or aggression replacement training was typically the one that would be the alternative, they would be referred to like a girls group. And there were two different models that I looked at. One was Girls Circle, which is a, is a ink, it's a disseminated model that's used in a lot of places nationally for justice involved girls and they even have developed like a justice girls module, um, like a 10 week uh, program 
And the other one was Girl Power, which was just developed by one local community that I took a, I took a look at as well to compare effects. And the actual hypothesis of the study was that participation in the girls' group would just be engaging and would help the girl then be more compliant with other kind of court orders as such as engagement in other evidence-based practice. And that because of that um, kind of mediating role, we would see an overall reduction in recidivism as a result of participation in this kind of empowerment-focused, um, engaging um, girls group. And it was, uh, unfortunately, didn't find that. Um, found no effect of um, girls group on recidivism, recidivism and actually was really um, sad to have to report that even though it just marginally is non-significant, um, found there was a slight trend that participation in the girls groups may have actually increased um, some recidivism, um, which uh, given the literature on uh, uh, programming with youth who are on the justice system, it's actually fairly consistent when you do group work with youth who come in, into the juvenile justice system. You have to be really, really careful around what we call peer contagion effects. Um, kids will pick up on kind of antisocial thinking and behaviors from other kids, particularly if you have a kid in the group who's really charismatic and um, just sort of, uh, you know, uh, be vocal <laughs> about things that are antisocial. And actually, when I followed up with the, the woman who was running Girl Power, and I hate those phone calls, you know, when you're a program evaluator and you, you, you gotta call up somebody and say, well, <laughs> it's not looking great. Um, she, it was really, she had a really interesting response. She was like, oh yeah, I could kind of see that because the girls would talk about like, like what they were doing wrong a lot. <laughs> and so you, know, you have to be really, really careful with these kinds of interventions um, that you're managing them uh, really, really carefully. Um, also, found that it wasn't related to the seriousness of offending. There was a thought that maybe participation in the girls group, maybe girls would um, continue to get involved in like minor offenses, but it would keep them from getting involved in more serious offenses, and didn't really find a robust effect for that either. And we also didn't find a difference in the type of treatment. This was actually um, a strong catalyst for, um, oh, the clock's not working. Anybody know what time it is? Oh, it is? I was totally like looking at that clock and like, I gotta like slow down. <laughs> Holy cow. Holy crap. Okay. Um, all right, just gonna blow through the rest of this. Um, this. This you might find really interesting though, particularly for folks who are less interested in juvenile justice and more interested in treatment for depression. What do girls actually say themselves around what they would find useful and what they like? So here are causal beliefs about girls and what, you know, around depression, like what causes your depression? By far, most of them are saying like negative thoughts, like cognitions, followed by like their own personality, relationship issues, family issues, and then followed by like trauma, friends, physical causes. I think it provides a little bit extra oomph for an argument that um, you know an empower, empower, empowerment-based approach is um, great for engagement, but we also need to be focusing on skills, and that kind of leads though. So, I want you to see that because I was so clever. It's great. Okay. This is a program that we're developing. And this, um, my, the research that I did on uh, girls group was a direct catalyst for this intervention that we're now developing um, called GREAT, Girls Regulating Emotions, Actions, and Thoughts are Collaborating with Lucy um, Berliner at her review um, really closely on it. And the idea is um, we're particularly, so remember that first class is kind of high trauma, high family conflict. Mm -hmm. We want to. We really want to focus on because we think that the other ones, the other kind of mo the other kind of evidence-based programs are probably doing pretty well for your general kind of parenting, monitoring, and negative peer type stuff. We think what's missing is sort of this work on the internalizing um, stuff and the and the trauma for girls. But we also know that trauma interventions on their own are not likely to lead to reductions in recidivism. So we need to integrate it with skills around problem solving and moral reasoning and things like that. So that's what this is. Um, I won't go into it too much. A couple of things around policy context. So the introduction kind of mentioned that um, we've been helping inform legislators around some of these issues. And just to make you aware, um, I've been part of the Justice for Girls Coalition in Washington State. We have a biannual conference called Beyond Pink. It's really fun. Um, in 2012, a House bill was passed um, because it 
around vacating uh, sentences for prostitution. So it was recognized that if girls are involved in trafficking and prostitution, they are victims. Um, and previously, they would be seen as um, perpetrators and being uh, sentenced under that law. So as long as they don't have more than one, they can vacate their first sentence around prostitution. Um, last year, as was mentioned, House Bill 1524 provides for increased diversion options for youth involved in the mental health, um, uh, involved in the juvenile justice system of mental health challenges, which we think will help, uh, particularly for girls. And unfortunately, it's likely to die today in rules, but House Bill 27-22 um, is an effort to reduce mandatory arrests around juvenile um, uh, domestic violence for juveniles. Um, but I will say that even if it doesn't make it out of rules today, it's been a fantastic catalyst for conversation. And uh, King County is now um, very, very interested in addressing this issue of DV arrest. I will say quickly, uh, DV arrest is the top reason girls come in contact with the justice system in King County. Um, it's the top reason for the detention of both males and females. We just have a lot of work to do on getting <coughs> prevention services to families more quickly around family conflict so they don't have to experience the collateral consequences of this in the justice system. And here's my acknowledgment. Um, and I guess we have like two minutes for questions. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Yes, that is really interesting. I don't know that much about you about this subject, but uh, as superficially, I was assuming that some relationships would be a primary driver, so it's interesting. It's definitely up there, but it wasn't but well below the personality. Oh, for girls' own ratings of what's driving it? Yeah, that is, yeah, and what they perceive, yeah. Although we do, I mean, definitely in other research, we see it as being one of the primary factors for police conduct and kind of conduct problems. Great, thank you very much.